Okay. So uh, today I'd like to introduce you our speaker, Rafael Robson Orlando dos Santos. Uh, he did his bachelor's and master's at the Sao Paulo State University in Brazil, and he's currently doing his PhD in the University of Southern Denmark. So uh, for me, it's particularly a pleasure, pleasure to, to have him here since like, we met uh, some years ago in, in some events in Brazil. Um, so I, I hope you all enjoy his talk on Asymptotic Safe today. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, then uh, most happy to, to be here. Thank you, the organizer, for the opportunity of talking a little bit about my my uh, project. And if for some reason the audio or the connection uh, is not good here, just let me know. Um, yeah. So, uh, as Gabriel told you, I'm a PhD student at the University of Southern Denmark, and. Um, yeah, I decided to include this uh, just very first slide just to show you where we are. We are between uh, Copenhagen and the continental part of Denmark in a city called Odense. It's a very uh, nice town and um, you, if you like bikes, uh, that's a very good place to live. But now uh, let's focus today on the um, here on the university stuff that you do and on our program of asymptotic safety in quantum gravity, which is the topic of uh, today's talk. And uh, I think it's uh, a very good, uh, uh, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about asymptotic safety, these two references that I, I present here are very good ones to, to have an overview about uh, the idea and also to find a reference that can be useful for you to to learn more about the topic. Just let me know by the end of the presentation if you need a reference or want to discuss something else. So as a summary of uh, what I will be uh, talking today, I will first start with an uh, introduction to quantum gravity, why we are trying to quantize gravity. Um, and then as an uh, intermed, so you talk a little bit asymptotic safety without gravity, just the concept of asymptotic safety. Then I talk a little bit about the machinery, I mean, the mathematical tool that we are, we have been using in, in, in most of the works in asymptotic safety quantum gravity. Then I jump to the point of asymptotically uh, safe quantum gravity and finish with a discussion uh, about the interplay between gravity and matter. We, then we define something that I call here the asymptotically safe landscape. So that's the program for today. And uh, um, yes, uh, this uh, first part is to introduce you to the fact that, and I think uh, probably you already heard about it and from the previous talks uh, here on the, uh, on the Younger Reserves of Quantum Graft, uh, people have talked about it. Uh, we know that uh, general relativity is not perturbatively renormalizable and basically uh, this is a consequence of the fact that the mass dimension of your Newton coupling um, is, uh, is negative. And because of that, uh, all the time that you want to include the uh, high order, di uh, introduce higher order diagrams, uh, higher order loop diagrams, you always introduce new divergences. And uh, you need to introduce counter terms then to, to, to cancel, let's say these new divergences. But then the point is that in order to renormalize it, you end up being uh, required to introduce an infinite number of counter terms. And why this is a problem? This is a problem because uh, we need experiments to fix these counter terms. Every time that we include a new one, um, it's an exp experiment that in the end we will fix the, the value of that coupling. And then all, all of this can be summarized in the fact that this renormalization procedure will demand an infinite number of experiments. And then at very large energy scales, general relativity loses predictivity. So that's the way I'd like to introduce the problem. And that's a good motivation to require asymptotic safety for quantum graph to solve this issue of predictivity. 
is it a problem? Not necessarily. If you treat general relativity as an effective theory, then you, you don't need to go to very arbitrary large energy scales. As, as you know, general relativity works very well in a lot of energy scales. But if you are interested in understand better uh, what is a theory of quantum gravity, and this is usually necessary when you talk about situations if singularities like black holes or initial singularities, and these uh, singularities are usually uh, present um, when you talk about um, scale, scale is close to the Planck scale, which is very large. Then in this very, very large energy scale, you should consider this problem of not having um, quantum theory of gravity as, as, as a serious problem. So with this in mind, uh, several people try to um, quantize gravity in different approaches. I here show some of them. Um, but I, I today I'd like to focus on, on the first one here in this list, which is basically the, the theoretical approach that I have been studying in the last months in my PhD here um, in Denmark under supervision of Asif Eichhorn. And uh, basically for the rest of the talk, I, I will just focus on asymptotic safety. And uh, something again that I'd like to emphasize is that the goal is to restore the predictive power of general relativity at high energies. And we uh, would get that by demanding something that I call here a quantum scale symmetry. So I try to uh, make it clear what I'm calling by a why I'm calling this a scale symmetry and why that would restore the predictive power. So that would be more or less the, 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 the mode uh, of the, the theme of the, of the talk today. So before talking about the quantum scale symmetry, then let's talk about uh, scale symmetry in a classical sense, let's say. Uh, as you can see in these two figures, there is something that uh, both uh, pictures share, which is the fact that if you focus on a part of the, a little part of your, of, of those objects, and then you go deep, the pattern that you had before starts to be reproduced again and again. So this is something called uh, as a self-similarity and Intuitively, this is more or less the idea that you, you want to, to pursue in, in asymptotic saved. And be sure, uh, before showing you this, I uh, just introduce some uh, useful concepts um, that uh, are important for the, the understanding of this, uh, this problem. And the first one is that to make it clear that we use uh, the effective action as one uh, very important object. And you can recall from your KFT lectures that uh, an effective action is the generator of one part uh, one particle reducible diagrams, and these effective action contain all the operators that are compatible with the symmetries of your theory. So it's not like the the microscopic uh, bare action where you have a finite number of terms, but in the effective action you you actually have an infinite number of operators, and then your theory space has um, an infinite dimension because of that. So that's something to, to take in mind. Uh, and you, you, let's assume that you can expand this um, uh, effective action as a sum of the different operators that are compatible with the symmetries of your theory. And then you have couplings uh, GI uh, for, for each uh, operator. And it's very useful in this program of asymptotic safety to define dimensionless couplings. Each of these couplings bar G will have some mass dimension. And then you just define these dimensionless couplings introducing a certain, uh, let's say energy scale K. And then I make the coupling dimensionless by, by using this definition here, where T is the dimension of the associated op operator. Um, yes. And then uh, to properly introduce asymptotic safety, we need the concept of beta functions, which more with basically we uh, say something about how the coupling changes when the, the scale changes. 
And now let's see the two requirements uh, for asymptotic safety in a given theory. The first one is that the beta functions associated to, uh, with the couplings of your theory, these beta functions should all be zero. And then this you define the coordinates of your fixed point. And this fixed point should be, uh, the coordinates of this fixed point should be all the real numbers. This is the first requirement and I will spend some time talking about it and about some properties um, regarding these beta functions. And uh, in the end of this first part of the talk, I will um, then focus on the second requirement, which is about the, that we need a finite number of relevant directions. And this is important for the predictive part that I was advertising before, okay? Right, so as a first uh, example, just to get some intuition, let's uh, try to think about what happens if you don't have fixed points at k going to infinity, so at very large scales. If we don't have a fixed point there, then we don't have a quantum scale symmetry. And the consequence is that your coupling, you, uh, you increase as you increase k and like you see in the, in the green line here, and then this coupling will end up blowing up. And this is what happens, for instance, in pure KD, where you have a Landau pole. So for a Landau pole, uh, your cup, some coupling you diverge for a finite value of K. So this is something that happens when you don't have this uh, fixed point at K going to infinity. However, now let's see uh, what happens when you have this uh, fixed point. Two things can happen, either asymptotic saved or asymptotic freedom. So asymptotic saved uh, will uh, be the case when the fixed point is, uh, is, uh, is different than zero. And then the, the, in the literature, you can see these fixed points being called either as uh, interacting fixed points, non-trivial or non-Gaussian fixed points. And I will probably be using interaction for the rest of the talk, but if I use one of the other terms, they are just synonyms. And the idea is that uh, if for a finite uh, non-zero value of this uh, coupling, your beta function is zero, since the beta function measures uh, how, uh, how the coupling changes with the scale, if it's zero, then the coupling is not changing anymore. So from a certain scale k, you can see that the coupling doesn't change anymore. And that's why this is good for if you are concerned about the renormalizability of your theory, because the coupling you stay well behaved, let's say. And that's why we call it a quantum scale symmetry. Quantum because there are quantum fluctuations that you induce this behavior here, this the presence of this uh, fixed point, and this scale symmetry because the coupling basically doesn't change as you as you you uh, increase k. It's it's a scaling behavior in the sense that the coupling you tend to the fixed point when k uh, have as a uh, tends to infinity. And the other situation uh, in, the, in the red line here is that uh, when your fixed point is zero, then you have asymptotic freedom because when k goes to infinity, your coupling is going to, to zero. And the classical example is the KCD, where at large energies, the coupling is zero. I also uh, highlight here some examples for asymptotic state. Examples that has nothing to do with uh, that have nothing to do with gravity. Uh, for instance, Genk Mu's in four plus epsilon, nonlinear sigma model in two plus epsilon, and a fermionic model called as a gross nouveau at D equals three. These are examples where asymptotic safety was checked uh, in different ways, let's say. Um, yeah, and before going to some more examples to, to let you uh, have some intuition about asymptotic safety, these are uh, definitions very, very useful uh, and they are about some properties of the flow. The flow, a flow because a beta, since the beta function measures uh, the change of your coupling um, with the scale, 
this you define a flow and the some properties of the flow can be read by discrete co-exponents, which are basically these eigenvalues of this uh, stability matrix that we can define at uh, each fixed point that you have. So depending on the sign of the real part of your critical exponent, we have some uh, different behaviors for this flow. And then these, uh, the, these, the eigenvectors are associated with um, either relevant, irrelevant, or marginal directions. And uh, if, for instance, you have a relevant direction, then the name that you usually use is that that fixed point is infrared repulsive or ultraviolet attractive. These are synonyms. And if the direction is irrelevant, then the fixed point is infrared attractive or ultraviolet repulsive. And the, the idea in the next examples is to motivate why this name, why infrared repulsive and why infrared attractive. And I will be focusing more on the versions as IR, repulsive and IR attractive, just to emphasize that the idea is that the flow goes from the UV to the IR, not the opposite, because we expect that your quantum field would give you imprints, imprints in the low energy, not the opposite one. So that's why you try is, uh, to keep using the name uh, infrared repulsive or infrared attractive here. But I think it can be also useful to, to think in the other way around, going from uh, small scales to uh, small uh, energy scales to large energy scales to have some intuition as well. All right, so my first example here for you is uh, about uh, three fixed points. And uh, on left, you can see two beta functions, both uh, cubic without any other terms, both g to the cube and, and the other one minus g to the cube. So let's try to understand what's happening in this case. Uh, so in the left-hand side, I plotted the beta function as a function of the coupling. And in the right-hand side is the solution of the beta function. Remember that the beta function is given by uh, the derivative of the coupling with respect to the scale k. So if you, if you just integrate that, you get a solution. And that's what you have plotted for some initial configuration uh, on the right-hand side. So uh, for this blue line here, you see that you have a fixed point at 0. It's the only uh, solution for a fixed point. And the idea is that this uh, fixed point is an uh, infrared fixed point. Because um, you can see that if you, if you depart from it, uh, for, for, from somewhere close to the fixed point, for, and wants to increase the value of your coupling, since the beta function is positive, then the, the, the k scale should be increasing as well, so things make sense. And that's why you, you get this uh, curve on the right. And you can then note that you cannot uh, simply go in uh, increasing k because at a certain value of k, the coupling diverges. And this is the Landau pole I was talking before. So this is not an asymptotically free situation. Okay. But you have here a fixed point, but a trivial fixed point, a free fixed point, not uh, an interaction one. The second case is uh, the case for asymptotic, uh, asymptotic freedom, where you have uh, a given beta function with a uh, free fixed point, but this fixed point here is not uh, uh, infrared anymore; is ultraviolet. And you can uh, and you can uh, understand this if you imagine that you depart from your, let's say, from the neighborhood of fixed points, trying to go towards larger values of G. And because of the fact that the beta function is negative, then the, the scale should decrease so that you have larger values of J. And this is what you see here on the right. Imagine you start uh, close to the fixed point, uh, as soon as you decrease your uh, your scale k, the the values of your coupling increase because the beta function is negative everywhere. 
So you depart from, let's say, from the value V from your fixed point and go towards the low energy values. And th there, and the low energy values that your coupling diverge. So this is the same behavior as you have uh, in uh, asymptotically, this is the behavior of asymptotic freedom. Um, yes, so this is the, the second example. So now the, I will show you two more examples where we have not only the free fixed point, but also interacting fixed points. And the first uh, toy model example here is this uh, cubic function with a linear term here. And the presence of this linear term here induced this interaction fixed point. And of course, with different powers here, but more or less, this is this view uh, be the case for some situations where without gravity, you have a, a beta function, a given behavior. And then when you include gravity, you earn a new term and that can induce a fixed point that you didn't have before. So as you can see, you have a new fixed point here, and this is an infrared uh, repulsive fixed point. I uh, you uh, talk a little bit about it in the in the plot on the right, but because of this is an infrared repulsive fixed point, and you can check that by computing the critical exponent is basically minus the derivative of the coupling with respect to the coupling evaluated at the fixed point. Um, and then uh, the idea is that uh, the flow would go from, from, the, from the UV to the IR, and that's why I chose the zeros in these directions here. So then imagine that you, you start very close to your uh, interaction fixed point, but for a value which is a little bit smaller than the, the value of the fixed point. Then uh, you see that uh, to go in this direction here, you, you decrease the values of your coupling uh, for a positive beta function. So this is only possible if your scale is decreasing. And that's why you see those orange and blue lines on the right. You start in your fixed point at the UV, and then you flow towards the IR, uh, towards the other fixed point that you have uh, at zero. OK, so this is what happens for those if you start from a configuration that has a, a value for your coupling that is smaller than the critical value, the fixed point value. Which here, in this case, the square root of 0 0.5. If you, if you start exactly on the fixed point, because it's a fixed point, you, you stay there forever. And that's why you have this black line here for any value of k. But now if you start for values that are larger than the, the fixed point value, then the values of G uh, increase here for a negative beta function. And again, uh, this is only possible if K decreases. So again, you depart from your interaction fixed point and goes toward the infrared values. But now, now you don't have any fixed point here anymore. So this cup, you just diverge if you go towards zero, k equals zero. Yeah, so basically this uh, describes the qualitatively the situation here where you have uh, interaction fixed point, which is uh, infrared repulsive. If it's infrared repulsive, as I told you, it's ultraviolet attractive. And why ultraviolet attractive? The name is because, as you can see, regardless of the place where you start, you always end up you always converge to that point, that fixed point. And is infrared repulsive because there is a, it's not convergent on the IR. Okay. Um, and now this next example is what happens when I flipped the orientation of this beta function. And basically I change where it was attractive, now is repulsive and vice versa. So I still have two fixed points, but now this fixed point that was uh, the trivial fixed point, uh, the, the sorry, the, the non-trivial fixed point that was um, IR repulsive now is IR attractive. And then I think it's useful to start uh, thinking about 
what happens close to the infrared repulsive fixed set point, which in this case is the free one. So imagine we start close to this free fixed set point, uh, some value a little bit larger than zero. So you will be increasing the value of G for a negative beta function. Then again, this is only possible if K decrease. And this is the situation in the, in the lines in the blue and orange lines. You start from your fixed point, which here is in the UV, uh, zero somewhere. And then as you go towards more values of K, you flow in towards the, the interaction fixed point which is here is again square root of 0 0.5. Okay, so you keep flowing uh, towards this, uh, in the, in, towards this uh, interaction fixed point. If you start on the, exactly on the interaction fixed point, again, you have this um, solid black line here. And now if you decide to start uh, for a certain value of your coupling that is larger than this, uh, fixed point, uh, then to, to increase the, the value of the coupling, because the fact, because the beta function is positive, you need to also increase the scale. And then you have this other line here, this other curve, where you can see that, uh, again, you have a lambda pole, because for a certain finite value of K, this coupling, you just diverge, okay? So this, uh, this picture is different than the previous one because now uh, you don't have things converging the ultraviolet anymore here. So depending on where you depart from your interaction fixed point, either from below or from above, you have different behaviors. But what is uh, interesting here is that regardless of the, where you depart from the UV, you are always ending up in your fixed point in the IR. That's why it's an infrared attractive. You are being attracted to this fixed point in the infrared. And also you have a you can predict the value of this fixed point. And that's a very good moment to recall what I was talking about predictive before, because I told you that I demand a finite number of relevant directions for asymptotic safety. And that's, that's the second condition here. Why this is important? Because it's fine to have an infinite number of irrelevant directions, because as you can see here, if you have an irrelevant direction and irrelevant directions, again, are synonymous for, in this case, infrared attractive uh, directions, then uh, the value of your coupling is predicted. So you don't need to make experiment to perform experiments to get this value, but if the direction is relevant, then you cannot you don't have predictions. You need to uh, perform experiments to have the value of that coupling. So you cannot have an infinite amount of relevant directions, just a finite one. Okay. And again, I'm talking about finite infinite uh, number because everything starts with that infinite dimension of your space. And we discuss soon how in practice we do, we consider things when you have this uh, infinite dimension of your space. Before um, giving a very, very brief pause, I would like to summarize the situation in this, in this plot, um, where you can see at least three of your couplings, uh, then you can either imagine that you just truncated the, the other couplings and instead of three, or just consider that the couplings that I don't show in this picture, they are all irrelevant. And the only couplings that are relevant are G1 and G2, or better saying, the eigenvalues associated with the relevant directions are uh, spanned by both G1 and G2. And then this, you define a critical hypersurface in purple here. And this tells you that uh, once you measure the values of G1 and G2, and this is, uh, this is showing this uh, point in yellow here, automatically you know the value of G3. And that's because G3 is, an, is associated with an irrelevant direction. So you don't need it to measure G3 
once you measure g1 and g2, g3 is given to you. So this is, this is a is a way to summarize the the or well, everything that I described when you have both relevant and uh, irrelevant directions. So if you have some questions, something that was very unclear, maybe you can ask now, or we can just uh, postpone for the end. Yeah, I see a uh, uh, raising hand. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, the question that I have is, is 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 sort of conceptual, and I guess applies to to many approaches to quantum field theory. But since the um, quantum uh, uh, asymptotic safety is, is is very much about restoring uh, predictivity or predictability of of the high uh, of the high energy uh, regime. Is it is it not possible or is it not conceivable that uh, that we that we will have to accept that the high energy regime may not be predictable or would you say that uh, it is necessary not just because we are we like <laughs> all our theories still now seem to be or at least the standard model is 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 well uh, predictive to a certain extent. Um, is there a deep reason why you think also a theory of gravity must be predictive or is it just something you hope for because well as a physicist you want to be able to do predictions yeah i see um i would say that um or at least the hope in this uh, program of asymptotic safety is that you'd have predictive in the sense that um, you don't need to, to, to perform an infinite number of ex experiments to be able to describe your theory. It might be also a little bit different than saying that, uh, okay, uh, with your theory, you'll be able to predict uh, the value of any coupling. So I think these concepts can be a little bit different. Uh, I, I don't think your theory needs to predict everything, just uh, maybe a set of some couplings that you be uh, that you allow you to compare your theory with some experiment, let's say, and validate your theory or not. So my impression is that at least part of the community would be happy to have a theory that can be tested, because then that can be excluded or or not. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that's that would be my my impression. And perhaps I'm one further question. I, I mean, you said we we basically start from this uh, uh, 1PI effective action, which contains all possible couplings that are consistent with symmetries of your theory. Yeah. Will there? Could you imagine that there are other uh, grounds on which you can, let's say, rule out some uh, some couplings? Maybe they uh, they require. Uh, they lead to uh, sort of ill post initial value problems or mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, uh, I think the what usually constrains the number of the, the, the possible terms are, let's say, if you want to impose new symmetries, uh, and then these you let's say you can get rid out of some of your terms if you have a new symmetry that you demand. This is a possible way to do. Um, about the the this um, other properties, or let's say some things, some properties that some of your couplings can have that are not good, uh, then I think that there is space to there is room for exploration on the side. I'm not sure if you can use this argument because things are usually let's say. Um, uh, in the end, as I show here, we we need to truncate to perform calculations, right? And then uh, I'm not sure uh, if uh, I mean I think the truncation is already is stronger enough to to be be concerned before being uh, worried about other um, other things. But yeah, I think this is a, this is a good question: how to 
how could you reduce the the, the theory space by using theoretical arguments? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So, are you continue now? And before going to the point of um, asymptotically safe quantum graph, exactly introducing gravity, I very briefly talk about this uh, functional renormalization group technique, which is the the let's say the machinery or the set of tools that I have been using to, and I guess most of the people most, uh, in asymptotic safety use to actually get. Uh, some results. And this idea is, is very much inspired by the Usonian approach to path integrals, where you integrate out quantum fluctuations. And that scale K that I was using before, we call it an RG scale, a renormalization group scale, that not always can be identified with some proper physical scale, like energy or momentum scale. So I prefer to use this term RG scale K. And the idea is that you have though that object, the effective action, uh, with here, you be, uh, let's say, interpolate between the bare action and the full effective action. The bare action is defined when k tends to infinity. So in this case, you are um, suppressing all of uh, all momenta by uh, this uh, infrared regulator here that we introduce in this framework of FRG, of uh, functional renormalization group. So it's a kind of mass-like regulator term that you suppress all small momentum modes. And then uh, you, in the other, on the other side, you have this full effective action when k tends to zero, and in this case, you don't suppress anything. So it's when you integrate out all the quantum fluctuations, let's say. So this effective action, this average effective action here, you flow towards these two regimes here. And this is basically the object that you, you we start with. Um, and I, I, I do not go into details in that, but there are very nice pedagogical reviews where you can see from going from these definitions here, from the generating function on the effective action, you can deduce a flow equation that is known as a Vettelich equation or flow equation, which is very interesting because it's exact and it's a one loop equation. So you can deduce this equation here. And uh, this is just a very pictorial way to, to, to show it's in one loop equation. Basically you have a propagator term here and this new piece here is uh, is what you call an insertion. So it depends on the regulator that you introduce in the framework. And by using this, uh, this equation, you can use it to, to, to extract the beta functions of your theory. Because in the end, as I talked a lot about the beta functions, we want to find the fixed point. So we need the beta functions. And it's very useful to use this equation by to extract these beta functions using a, let's say some, some, some schemes to, to get it. And it's very nice because they are always one loop. So don't need to take, to, to, uh, to be concerned about two loop, three loops and so on. Because this you naturally generate uh, one loop diagrams, okay? But of course, this effective action depends on or would depend on infinite number of operators. And then you, you start to imagine here that on left-hand side, you have gamma, the right-hand side, you have the derivative of the gamma respect of your field. Then these equations will be all coupled, one equation for let's say each coupling of your theory. And then to actually solve it, you need to truncate. So that's a good point to talk about the limitations of the this framework that I'm talking about. So first, you have an infinite dimension of your space, so you need to truncate it. And of course, as you this you start to introduce systematic uncertainty, let's say. And then it's a very good idea that then you check convergence of different expansion schemes. So what happens if you include new terms in your truncation? 
is this uh, is your is are some of your quantities converging? Uh, another important issue is the fact that all of uh, all of this notion of infrared regulator that uh, I showed you uh, requires uh, Euclidean signature because you needed to to know you needed to know uh, what is a larger or a smaller momenta than the the RG scale, and this is not uh, since this quantity is not defined in Minkowski because it's not positive defined. You actually need to do that in the Euclidean signature. And then the issue is that since the Vicky rotation is not well defined for non perturbative calculations, if you try to do that with gravity, then it's not clear how we can actually come back to the Minkowski signature. So this is an open, open question in the field. Also, the fact that the regulator that we introduce will generally break gauge invariance of your theory without the regulator. And then you need to work a little bit with some uh, identities to, to take care of it. But I think the punchline is this uh, is uh, that uh, with all of these truncations and all of these uh, limitations, we are introducing systematic uncertainties to the problem. So I, I you talk a lot about, okay, you can make predictions, but take in mind that there will be uncertainties be behind those predictions because we don't know how to uh, do things without these limitations here, including the fact that some universal quantities like critical ex exponents that they are expect not to depend on the gauge or scheme. Since we are truncating the theory space, uh, this might not be the case anymore. So you always need to check and cross check with different schemes what's happening to, to at least see if it, what you're doing is reliable or not. So yeah, I think this is an important uh, piece of information. Take this as a grain of salt that the results depend on truncation and there are systematic uncertainties. So there are still a lot of work to, to do in this, in this approach. Okay, but um, let's now go to, to asymptotically safe quantum graft. And here I'd like to give you an overview of what has been done so far in the field. And there, in hopefully, and there will exist a fixed point. Um, and fortunately, there is a mountain evidence for that. There are several works in the literature exploring this idea, and they are, they, there are indications for the existence of this fixed point. And, and if also evidence that you have a finite number of relevant directions, which are the two requirements that I showed you before. I think you can. We can then very briefly discuss a simple example. If you if you choose as your truncation just the Einstein Hibbert action without any other term that is invariant in the DFR morphism, then I, uh, you can show that the beta function assumes this form here, where quantum fluctuations will basically be the, be the responsible to induce a, a interaction fixed point, and that's what you want. And it's a relevant, it's, uh, then it's a relevant direction because the critical exponent is positive here. So it's ex exactly what you want. Note that you cannot have uh, your uh, a free fixed point for, uh, for, for general relativity because this, uh, if you, if you, this uh, free fixed point at K at infinity uh, was the fixed point uh, that you are pursuing, then if you start there at zero at infinity, because it's an irrelevant direction, the flow would go exactly towards zero in the infrared. And you don't want to have a zero Newton coupling in the infrared. So you cannot, this cannot be the fixed point that you are looking for, but this one, the interaction one. That's why I emphasize this. Uh, this uh, here in this plot, this would be the the fixed point that you are interested to, and that could give you some uh, nice uh, result on on a possible uh, renormalizability of uh, general relativity. Okay, so uh, this is the simple example. Uh, then the natural. Uh, 
uh, step forward is then to include the cosmological constant and then start to include quadratic uh, operators that are quadratic in curvature and so on. Uh, because all of these quantities, all of these operators are invariant under the diffeomorphism, so they should be included in your effective action. And just uh, as a note, if you don't include them, if you then compute the flow naturally, these terms you'll be induced. So it's a good idea to start with then at the beginning. Okay. But given a truncation that you start with, then to make things consistent, you should uh, then you'll be able to map uh, what's the evolution, let's say, of your, the couplings associated to the operators that you started with. And then you'll be able to say if they associate with relevant directions or irrelevant directions and so on. And the summary is that if we stay with the gravitational coupling, if the Eisenhower action, if uh, the cosmological constant, this the neutral coupling, the cosmological constant will be associated to both relevant directions. So that's why I wrote here that GN cannot be predicted because since it's a relevant direction, you don't have a, a you cannot predict the value of it. You need it to measure. Uh, so in asymptotic shape, uh, neither the cosmological constant nor the, the Newton coupling can be predicted. They need to be measured, which is not bad in the sense then that you not rule out your theory because you expect a negative cosmological constant. It's just that you don't have access to, to the value. So it's fine in this case. Um, and um, and the next point is that when you include this uh, the set of operators that are product in curvature, then you earn one more relevant direction um, and uh, associated with one of those quadratic curvature couplings. Okay. And then I decided to take this table from one of the reviews on uh, where you can see uh, what sort of operators were included so far in the literature. You can see there are a bunch of works that include the high order curvatures in the Rick scalar, but not so many works with the other quantities because it's pretty hard to, to compute things with these tensor quantities here. But the good news is that it seems that the number of relevant directions are converging to three which is, which is uh, very nice because if you start to get different numbers, see a four, five, two, three, then it would be a sign that uh, that thing that I told you, that told you that you need to check the convergence of your scheme, that would not be happening. So, so it's, it's good news that you, you usually have these three relevant directions here. I see the, the, the hand raised. Do you have a question? I think it was from the from the old question. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, also something very important are the critical exponents. They are um, they. It's a good sign that your critical exponents are close to the values, to the canonical values, when you don't have quantum fluctuations. Because that would show that your, let's say, your near perturbative computation is reliable. And you can see that when you go from R square to the R cube, that the critical exponent that was very large became close to two, which is the canonical value. So that's actually a good sign, a good news, because then you, you stabilize the, the value of this critical exponent here in this rich scalar truncation. So that's what I was saying that. Um, you should check uh, the conversions in your different schemes. And this is uh, usually code that you have a good near canonical scaling behavior for your critical exponents here. Okay. All uh, right. Uh, do, do you, can you let me know how many minutes I have? I, you're muted, Gabriel. Oh yeah, I was muted. So uh, kind of zero, but <laughs> <laughs> how much time do you need? I can refer, I can talk, I think it's important I mentioned uh, the interplay between matter and gravity, so. Okay, so do you think yeah. you can do that in Yeah, I try to, to be concise, yes. Okay, thank sure. you. No problem. Great.
So now uh, I talked about craft, but as you know, the word uh, has matter. And then the question is, we cannot simply do things just with a canvas without the painting, we need both together. And I always like to use this, that the painting needs both sides. And the analogy here is that you need both private sector and matter sector to actually answer the question if your theory is, is renormalized or not. Um, the first question is, does the matter content view spoil all of that fixed point structure that I sh just showed you? And good news is that there are indications for that, that under the impact of standard model, some be under standard model matter fields, you have a good fixed point structure in your gravitational sector. And also you can do the opposite question, does the gravitational sector change the fixed point structure that you have in the matter content. So then I would like to highlight two things. The first one is the Wickraft bound, which is one example of something that can actually constrain the parameter space of a gravitational theory, because large values of fixed point values of gravitational parameters can spoil matter fixed points. And another nice thing is the asymptotically safe landscape we here I call these as a set of your effective field theories that are compatible with an asymptotically safe ultraviolet completion. So this is good because this is highly related to the pred predictive power. Because now imagine that you have uh, some matter model and you want to to understand what happens when you include gravity. So you can actually make some coupling predictive when you include gravity. And then you can explore this as trying to get imprints from the UV in the IR. So I think this is a very interesting um, uh, feature that I can show you uh, in, in one slide here. I just uh, I, I jumped this talk about we craft bound, but the punchline here was to show you that uh, you constrain the parameter space of your gravitational sector. And uh, because that would spoil fixed points in the matter sector. So that's why you have a region in red here. But then if you take the fixed point values that were computed uh, in, let's say, in the gravitor sector, in the graph sector, some with the number of scalar fields that you have, it might be that those fixed points lie exactly on the forbidden region. And in the previous work, that was the idea to say that, okay, if you keep doing that just with scalar fields, you never leave this region. But if you now include fermions and vectors, you actually leave. So it's, a, it's actually interesting because it's telling you that you need some sort of spin matter degrees of freedom to, to have things working properly. And the other application here can be seen as this axon like particle. This work together with Astrid and uh, Gustavo de Brit, which is uh, uh, my collaborator here in Denmark. And the idea was that there is no fixed point that is viable without gravity for this axon like particle model. So it's not renormalizable, basically. And then what happens when you include gravity is that we start to have good fixed points. In this case, you want something that can be, let's say, consistent with an axon like particle model that's usually related to, let's say, dark matter search. So you want a very small mass, but doesn't, it should not be zero. And you, you want a finite non-zero value for, for the coupling G, the photon axon coupling. And then we demand that both relevant directions then the question is, those uh, relevant directions exist so that you can have this viable picture of uh, Alps in asymptotic safety. And indeed, you can see that it's possible. There is a region in the parameter space where you have both the, the, the signs of the critical exponents that you want, both for a free fixed point case where you have the Gaussian fixed point here, and also for the not for an interact fixed point with uh, mass equals to zero, but g different than zero. 
So re remember, these the fixed points are uh, at the, the UV. And the important question is what happens if this coupling is in the IR? Because it's the IR that you measure things and you can compare with experience. So that's why there are these requirements here. And this mechanism that we explore in this work can also be found in abelian gauge couplings, in Yukawa couplings, and something very interesting to explore. But as a very important uh, thing is that since there are constraints coming, for instance, from the Wheatcraft bound, that picture, that region that could be good is actually not that large because it starts to be constrained by other things. So at least in our uh, tentative answer or first tentative answer to our, uh, the viability of an axon-like particle model in an asymptotic state scenario, we conclude that it's likely it cannot be accommodated because basically the, the possible values of G are too large to do so. And you'd like to have smaller values of G in order to avoid the cleft bound and also other issues. But I, what, what I would like to emphasize with this example here is that you can actually say something about the infrared physics by knowing what's happening in the UV physics. And I think this is a very um, interesting uh, feature of this asymptotically safe quantum gravity program, because you, of course you have a bunch of systematic uncertainties and truncation dependencies, but at least you have the possibility to check what are the, what, what are the imprints of your theory in the infrared physics because you have the flow, you have the flow equation, you have the beta functions and you can check if you have fixed points and then check all of these things that I uh, try to uh, talk to you today. So that's it, I think uh, it's, uh, I'm over here and thank you for, again, for the opportunity to talk about the synthetic safety and just ask me questions if you, if you have. So uh, let's first thank our speaker. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Rafael, um, for the very nice talk. So let's start with the questions. You can just uh, unmute your microphone and if we have people trying to ask questions at the same time, then we can raise hands. Okay, so actually I have a question. Uh, so you said that, okay, yeah, sure. 